Welcome to um, the Kauffman Foundation session on what we do and how we strengthen entrepreneurs in their communities. We're super excited to have this session and we're really looking forward to learning and hearing from you. Um, my name is uh, Samiksha Desai and I'm the Director of Research in Entrepreneurship at the Kauffman Foundation. And uh, on stage with me are my colleagues, uh, Philip Gaskin, he's the Senior Director in Entrepreneurship, and Andy Stoll, who's our Senior Program Officer. Um, and both of them, if you were not at the dinner last night, shared um, uh, the award with our Vice President, Victor Huang, who's back there hiding. Um, and so uh, we're just really glad to be here. Um, what we want to do is talk to you a little bit about what we do at the Foundation. We um, are focused on education and entrepreneurship, and I'm going to talk about what we do in entrepreneurship here. We've had a long association with the Global Entrepreneurship Network and the Global Entrepreneurship Research Network, and we view them as really great accelerators of, um, of work on entrepreneurship. Um, and, uh, oh. You can go back. Okay. All right, here we go. So, strengthening uh, entrepreneurs and, and their communities. Um, so, our work in entrepreneurship spans several areas. We have um, programs on education that deliver learnings and offer peer platforms to entrepreneurs. We work on ecosystems and market gaps, which Philip will talk about later. Um, and uh, we do research and we work on policy. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about our research. Uh, one of the goals of research at the Kauffman Foundation is to create uh, practical, actionable, oriented information that policymakers, entrepreneurship support organizations, and entrepreneurs can use in making decisions and understanding what the context is that they're operating in. Our top line goals across entrepreneurship uh, are that we want to serve 200 communities and 200,000 entrepreneurs in five years. And so that drives everything we do, including the way that we view and conduct our research activities. So I'm gonna share with you just a brief preview of research and that's how we inform our work and then Andy and Philip are gonna talk about how we actually do our work. So um, we recently released a set of early stage indicators and um, these indicators are designed to capture what happens in the first year or up until the end of the first 12 months of uh, the entrepreneur's journey. Just a, a brief preview in the United States. Um, the rate of new entrepreneurs, which captures new business creation regardless of incorporation status and uh, employer status. So that means everybody from self-employed to uh, a large new employer will be captured in that. Um, we look at market gaps, which Philip will talk about, and so I put this up here because I wanted you to see the trend from 1996 to 2018. And this is something that I've heard echoed again and again at this, uh, at this Congress as well, is a lot of people are talking about the gap between uh, women and, um, and men's entrepreneurship. Uh, we see the same trend in the United States, and so this is something that we really uh, closely and carefully track. Um, the second thing, again, I've heard echoes of this uh, at this Congress that I want to show you is what we call opportunity share. And um, for, uh, in the, uh, so from 1998 to 2018, um, you'll see opportunity share for four different demographics. Um, opportunity share refers to entrepreneurs that start a business out of opportunity and not out of necessity. So for example, not because they were unemployed or um, couldn't find a job that um, uh, was appropriate to their skill level. And so you see fairly large disparities in, uh, in these numbers. So for example, you'll see college graduates tend to have the highest rate of opportunity share. Um, and, uh, and that changes as you go further down in terms of educational attainment. So, when we think about serving entrepreneurs and serving communities, educational status and access to education are part of, um, part of the things that we look at. Uh, this one is um, startup early job creation. And so this is a really exciting new indicator. This captures the average number of jobs created within the first year of a business. 
And um, this is the trend for the country. And so one of the things that we're really focused on at the Kauffman Foundation is the decline in entrepreneurship in the United States um, over recent decades. And you see that actually as that decline has happened, so too has the number of jobs um, created declined. So um, you actually see fewer jobs created on average by startups as the um, number of startups in the country have declined. And so that's a huge focal point um, from, uh, or that has huge consequences from a policy perspective. This is just a map, I love this map. Um, so this is just a map of uh, all the states um, in the country and their uh, average job creation. And what you'll see is there's significant and also substantial variation across the country. And then the last uh, indicator I'm gonna show you is the startup early survival rate. And this is uh, something that actually in the last few years has stayed fairly constant. And this indicator shows you uh, how uh, the percentage of startups within the first 12 months that have survived to the end of those 12 months. And um, that number is actually surprisingly uh, low, um, and, uh, uh, but consistent. Here's another map that shows you how that looks across the country, and um, there's significant regional variation there as well. So um, on the research side, what we really want to do is come up with indicators and metrics that serve you. And so if you have any feedback, if you have any thoughts, um, we know everybody's asking for indicators and everyone's asking for metrics. We wanna learn what you're doing. Um, and so please feel free to share uh, as, as we move forward with our research. And I'm gonna turn it over to Philip Gaskin. Thank you, Sammy. Um, uh, you know, what you're talking about there, Sammy, when you were talking, it just rang to me, you're talking about a fair shot for everyone, that everyone has to have a chance to be in the game in order to have a chance to start a business, have their own livelihood. You know, at the end of the day, this is a survival game. And we look at our, our data in the United States, half of our population in 25 to 30 years is going to be made up of women and people of color. Those are two of the demographics that are having the biggest challenge starting a business and growing one. So it becomes a numbers game. If enough people aren't allowed a fair shot to start a business that can then employ people who can then be part of the economy, the United States economy is going to be in trouble. So we launched a couple years ago a campaign called Zero Barriers, a Zero Barriers campaign. Zero Barriers to Startup and Zero Barriers to Growth because the more inclusive our economies can be, and economies are local, obviously, but the more inclusive our economies can be, the more fair shots there are for people to start businesses. One of the things that we do, um, and Sammy mentioned the word gaps a couple of times, we actually have a, a program called Market Gaps uh, internally in our entrepreneurship department. And what that is, it's a grantee, it's a unique grantee portfolio where we provide grants to organizations, entrepreneur support organizations, that are specifically looking at the unique barriers, demographic, geographic, et cetera, type of barriers that are systemically in the way of people starting businesses. And that, the geographic could be, you know, in the United States, it could be urban, urban edge, it could be rural, right? Demographics, uh, race, gender, sexual preference, what have you. And we've uh, done three RFPs uh, in, the, in the US and uh, about 35 to 40 grantees so far across a wide range of barriers being addressed, whether it's procurement, whether it's mentorship, whether it's capital. And these are the type of things that we want to continue doing to support entrepreneurs. We don't uh, provide grants directly to entrepreneurs. We provide grants in the US that are to organizations that support entrepreneurs and then help with those barriers. So, um, Sammy mentioned you mentioned um, you know our our two top line goals of strengthening entrepreneurs and strengthening communities. It's a little bit of background on what we specifically do to help entrepreneurs um, from a zero barriers perspective. And I will turn it over to Andy to um, give uh, more detail on what we do from the communities perspective. 
Thank you, Philip. Uh, I have some slides, so I'm actually going to I'll mix it up. I'll stand on this side. How about that? Uh, good, good morning or afternoon, or my brain is in U.S. time, so it's the middle of the night. But uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks uh, for joining. My name is Andy Stoll. I am a senior program officer at the Kauffman Foundation. Sammy's talked a little bit about our research work, uh, kind of just spent just a, the top level of our research. Uh, that could be a whole session of itself. Philip has talked a little bit about the work we do individually to support entrepreneurs, particularly to level the playing field uh, through our Market Gaps program. And the work that I do is to help lead the team that thinks about ecosystems or the communities that surround entrepreneurs. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a, again, top level view of how we see it and then specifically how the Kauffman Foundation is uh, trying to affect the work. You all are doing the work. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll, we'll give a good amount of time when I finish for just sort of an open conversation and Q&A uh, that you can d dive deeper into any of this. Um, but right now I'm going to talk about the thing that I think most of you think a lot about, which is how do we build communities that support entrepreneurs? Is that a thing that anyone in this room has thought about at all? How do we build communities that support entrepreneurs or these ecosystems? Um, we think a lot about it at the foundation, and we spend a lot of time talking to people who are, who are ecosystem builders. Because that term ecosystem building is a little bit uh, loose on definition, I want to talk just uh, to start out uh, about what an ecosystem is and what an ecosystem builder is as we see it from the Coffin Foundation perspective, just to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. So as Sammy indicated, um, within much of our research, uh, there has been a decline in entrepreneurial activity in the United States, in particular companies that we would call employer firms, which are companies that employ at least one other person in addition to the founder. So the Coffin Foundation has been funding work in the United States, which is our primary focus for over thir those 30 years while well, we've seen the decline in entrepreneurship happen. So it is clear from the research and the work that we've helped support in the United States that the traditional ways of thinking about helping entrepreneurship, they're not, it's not to say they're wrong, but the, the, really the thought is maybe they are incomplete. And so I want to talk a little bit about the notion of ecosystems and why they're important. Because a new model, we believe, is required. And you all, many of you, are out in your countries and your communities pioneering this new model, which in recent years has sort of come to be called ecosystem building or startup community building. Uh, I, in Europe, I also often hear ecosystem developer or development as the, as the phrase. But we believe that ecosystem building is a new emerging model for economic development in this new era. That ecosystem building really sits at the intersection of economic and community development, where the top-down institutions are helping the bottom-up grassroots activity to create the environment that fosters more entrepreneurship. So let's talk about what is an ecosystem. I'm sure everyone gets this here, but just to level set, I'm going to share just the basic definition that is part of the roadshow that we give when we travel around the US. So this is Maria. Maria is an entrepreneur. Like all good entrepreneurs, she has a great idea, but she doesn't have all the knowledge necessary to be able to build her company or to turn her idea into a company and build a company. The good news is the knowledge and the resources that Maria need exists out in the universe. So Maria's job as an entrepreneur is very straightforward, but in incredibly complex. Maria's got to run around in the right order to the right resource to get the knowledge that she needs and the resources she needs as quick as possible in the right order before she runs out of money, energy, uh, hope, or her spouse says, honey, go get a real job. So our job as ecosystem builders is very straightforward but also complex. Our job is to take all of these resources in our community and pre-connect them together before Maria shows up so that when Maria walks into the ecosystem, she can find the knowledge and resources she needs. The primary function of an entrepreneurial ecosystem is to move the knowledge and resources from the people who have it to the entrepreneurs who need it. Let me say that one more time. The primary function of an entrepreneurial ecosystem is to move knowledge and resources from the people who have it to the entrepreneurs who need it. So we've got to pre-connect together these resources, and then we have to sort of grease the skids between those resources so that they work together and they collaborate. How do we do that? We actually do that through creating a culture. A culture says, help each other, collaborate, dream big, fail, get up, brush yourself off, try again, give before you get. And it's this culture that's actually the accelerant 
It's the thing that makes all these individual pieces add up to the sum that is greater than the whole of its parts. So we believe that ecosystem building, in ecosystem building, that culture, the culture we create through many different means is actually the primary driver or will be the primary driver of entrepreneur-led economic development. And you all are the pioneers of this work. A uh, quick uh, way for that, you know, equation to help us remember this. Uh, we always say uh, P plus C equals E, people plus culture equals everything. I don't need to explain that to you all, but we can get into that in the q and if you want to. So this new model of economic development or ecosystem building says the old way was we thought we need more capital and technology and training or incubators, more policy incentives. And those are things you all work on every day. And yes, that's important, but it's incomplete. It's missing the notion of ecosystem building, which is the new model, which says we've got to figure out how to collaborate, how to trust each other, how to create social capital, and trust, connectivity, collaboration, and diversity within our ecosystems that creates the environment in which entrepreneurs can thrive. So these ecosystems that, need to be, uh, that, need to, that are needed to support entrepreneurs, they can't be bought, they have to be built. And so in order to build them, you need, you need to, a person or people who really think with this notion that entrepreneurship is a community sport. The success of the individual entrepreneur is dependent as much on the people around them as the original idea that maybe started the venture, right? So it is that notion of working together is how we raise, raise the quality uh, of our experience as entrepreneurs and for our entrepreneurs in our communities. So we believe that the communities that will thrive as we transition into clearly a new era, a new economy, are those that help all people make new ideas happen. And in order to build those ecosystems, we need people to do that. And so that's the emergence of this notion of the ecosystem builder. Ecosystem Builder is a person who looks at all the pieces of the community and says, maybe we can organize this and connect these together better. The Ecosystem Builder's job is to step up, consider the whole system, enhance the individual parts, and then how those, those pieces work together. How many people would say they're an Ecosystem Builder in this room based on this definition? Many of you, okay. So the Ecosystem Builder has a really, really important job. It's to build infrastructure to support entrepreneurs, but it's a different kind of infrastructure. It's an invisible infrastructure, right? The key role of the ecosystem builder is to focus on building consistent and collaborative human engagement. It's not necessarily about big buildings or fancy pools of capital or, or, or slick signage and marketing, but it's around how do we create the environment in which people collaborate together to make their ideas happen. So this leads to where our strategy around ecosystem building or development focuses, which is on this idea that there are people like you all over the world, all out across this convention center, all around the world building these ecosystems. But most of them you are doing this in very custom and bespoke ways, which uh, for many of you means we're making some stuff up. But if this is a new emerging role, the ecosystem builder, in a new emerging field, ecosystem building, that's gonna drive our economy creating entrepreneur-led communities and entrepreneur-led economies, there needs to be a stronger field around these folks. A field or a profession would have some basic things. We'd agree upon why we are doing this. We'd agree upon how we are doing this. We'd agree upon how we would measure how we would do this. And simple things like training, accreditation, professional associations, support groups, consultants, all of these things don't exist in a very organized way right now. And so the work the Coffin Foundation and that we're focused on is how do we create and focus on helping to build a field around the people doing ecosystem building, that's you. We are in the very early stages of this. We've published a super early draft framework and playbook around ecosystem building and we're looking for your ideas, feedback, and stories. Um, but a lot of our work is really centered around how do we help accelerate the field of ecosystem building. And I won't get into this, I'm going to wrap up now, but I, and I won't get into this, but we can if you want to in the Q&A, is we have worked with about a thousand ecosystem builders, many from the U.S. and a number from overseas, to look at how we build the field of ecosystem building. And like, uh, inspired by the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we've developed these seven e-ship goals, which are the goals that we believe we all collectively need to solve for to create a field around the ecosystem builders like yourselves. So we can get more into that if you'd like. Uh, uh, and you can also look it up more online. I'll share, I'll leave a website up uh, that you can check out as, uh, as I wrap up uh, if you want more information. Uh, but I'll leave you with the words of Mr. Kaufman here. 
um, that all the money in the world cannot solve problems unless we work together. This applies both to your local ecosystems and the work we have to do to accelerate the growing field of entrepreneurial ecosystem building. Thank you. We have some time for Q&A, if anybody would like to um, ask questions. Yep, in the back. I'll be the mic around. Yeah, hello. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting figures and uh, uh, information. Uh, what do you think about, in general, the silver wave, what is coming toward the Earth? Because obviously the generation, can you hear me? Yeah, the population is growing quite fast and uh, the most of the money actually is within the silver generation, which are now 50 and above. So uh, I think as well there should be, I don't know, inspiring for the entrepreneurship in this kind of category when the people are retired and to regain into society and not only be <coughs> dumped to just to consume. Yeah, I would, I would say thank you for that. I am... Um we're actually looking at a potential grant in the, in the U.S. to work with an organization that is specifically trying to help the, the silver generation because there's a, I don't know if you've heard of an organization in the, in the U.S. called Encore. It's about Encore careers, people that have had one or two or three careers and are at that age set and they have so many different skills to not only offer and what are those to an entrepreneur, mentorship, how to build a business, whatever it may be, and to also start their own business at that age and to encourage that because of the age, the age demographic. So that's my thought on that. I don't know if you want, anyone want to add anything. So could I? Uh, I'll echo what, what Philip said, but also, um, uh, but also one of the uh, metrics that we track, which I didn't show, is uh, entrepreneurship and opportunity by age. And um, the, uh, the trends are actually quite interesting. When you look at the older demographic, you see quite robust rates of entrepreneurship. And that's, so that's something from a research perspective to keep an eye on. And we're really trying to understand more clearly what it is they're doing. So we, can, we know that they're doing something, but we're trying to understand, are they starting businesses? Are they doing um, you know, sort of part-time work? What kind of revenues or profits are coming in? And, how all of that looks. It's just very tough to get into that. Yeah. Uh, it's Sandy Gilbert from Canada. Um, I'm involved in an organization called Intergen that is bringing together retired and transitioning executives with scaling companies to help them in business operations and grow their companies. And we had a, a gala event a year ago called the Top 7 Over 70. And it was a um, gala to recognize uh, seven entrepreneurs that had launched a new venture after the age of 70. So my board is full of um, inspiring um, 86 and 76 year old uh, men and women that um, are really focused on helping get that natural resource we have uh, in the talent that we have in our seniors to actually get them to participate and feel purpose in uh, getting involved in entrepreneurs. And a lot of that has come out of the research that we've seen out of Kaufman. So we'd like to see the top seven over 70 uh, expand globally. So uh, let's make it happen. It is in Alberta. Yeah, exactly. How Jim, Jim Gray. How many folks in this room think about senior entrepreneurship or older entrepreneurship? Just raise your hand if you think about it. Okay, look around you, see who's close by. After the session's over, make a new friend. In the back? Is your hand up in the back? Uh, yeah, so uh, hello, my name is uh, Diederik. I'm a uh, managing director of uh, Refugees Forward Incubator. Uh, we are an incubator for people with a refugee background in uh, Amsterdam and Rotterdam. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your insights. Uh, I would say that you are uh, the first foundation that I've come across in which uh, I would not be looking first and foremost for, for money, but for uh, uh, knowledge. So yeah, I think that's to be applauded. Um, I really like the way you uh, display how to build ecosystems. But what I took also from the plenary session yesterday is that here's a lot of focus around building international uh, uh, ecosystems or uh, digital ecosystems, etc. 
to what extent do you think that's feasible? Because uh, yeah, how how uh, necessary is the physical place in order to build an ecosystem? So, is it possible to develop international or digital uh, ecosystems around entrepreneurship? I can take that one. So I think the, the, the function you're trying to create in any ecosystem is to create the collision between people, ideas, and resources. And in those collisions, those happen often what I call intersections. So those intersections could be a physical place, uh, like the Gen Center in South Africa. Uh, the, it could be an event, like a startup weekend in your community. It could be an office, like a small business development center where people go and there's like, you know, connections being made, but also online communities as well. So whatever facilitates the connection and the collision between people, ideas, and resources, where those two things can connect, I think is, is absolutely the way to do it. The trick is, if it's an online space, it's sometimes a little more difficult to create and maintain a culture uh, than it would be, say, in a physical location or a co-working space. But whatever, whatever facilitates that. The thing, when I get lost in ecosystem building, I go back to the phrase that I repeated earlier, which is sort of my grounding phrase, which is the primary function of an entrepreneurial ecosystem is to move knowledge and resources from the people who have it to the entrepreneurs. And so if you're online, international, global, whatever does that, then absolutely that's helpful to the entrepreneurs. That's my perspective. Hi, uh, my name is Shri. I am the founder chief mentor at Kuzza Shara, a Kenyan social enterprise, and I'm also a Kaufman Fellow. Uh, I want to actually co relate to what you just said. Uh, I've actually been building communities at a grassroots level. And the way we are doing is we go into the rural communities, we identify some of the enterprising youth, empower them, and make them an agents of change. So I'm working with smallholder farmers. A rural youth is managing about 200 farmers using an uh, ecosystem play. I, I, I can resonate with a lot of things that you just said. And we use the community structures as a hub, a point of presence. That's what we call them. And this agent is the one who is managing all the resources that are required by the performers, organizing inputs, organizing knowledge, organizing connection to the marketplace and all of that. And we are exponentially growing this. And we will be having a million farmers by end of this year. I would love to contribute some of this to your research. Thank you. Right. Uh, I'll ask a question here. Hi, Andy. Hi, Hi. Sammy. Um, so number, goal number seven around sustainability, I've been doing ecosystem building probably for seven years, I guess now. Um, sustainability is always one of those things that is elusive, if you will. So when I was uh, when I was at the Obama administration, we would give money to these communities to help do this. But then I've seen some of those that have like fallen off because they can't figure out how to extract payment from the people that they're trying to help because the people that they're trying to help don't have money yet. And so I wonder if you can talk to a little bit about what you're seeing or what what you see as opportunities for ecosystem builders to get paid or to be able to. To, sure. to sustain what they're doing, both personally and, and you know, organizationally. Let me ask this question. How many people, raise your hand if you consider yourself an eco, entrepreneurial ecosystem builder. Raise your hand, be proud. You're, okay, so how many, keep your hand up if you're getting paid to do this and you get a check every month. Wow, okay, so like two thirds of the, let's do that again. Everyone who's an ecosystem builder, put your hands up high. Now leave your hand up if you're getting paid consistently. Okay, so about half the hands went down. So uh, your question ultimately was, let's talk about funding and sustainability for ecosystem builders. I think because it's a new emerging profession, as you very well know, that uh, there is not a very clear and obvious business model for ecosystem building. What, what, I, what we can see from our vantage point, mostly looking in the US is where, where I see the most activity, is that ecosystem builders who are working on the system level have to figure out how to get paid, so they start doing stuff on the individual intervention level. So they start an accelerator, a co-working space, uh, a venture capital fund or a seed fund. It's not to say those don't build the ecosystem, but it gets a little distracting because you're you're now now you're working on your node, not the whole system. I would say there's in the U.S. there's no obvious, repeatable business model that we've seen, and it mostly turns into, well, shouldn't the government pay us? Well, you you were the federal government, and you know that's not sustainable as well. Um, some of the I think. Uh, uh, hope we're starting to see or, or possibility we're starting to see is folks, again, I'm, again, we look mostly at the U.S., so I'm speaking about U.S. context. 
is traditional economic development organizations who have spent money that has been raised through various means to attract and retain larger companies are beginning to recognize that they, some of that money could be spent on building the system to grow the next big enterprise. But what we really see is the cities and the communities in the US where things are really starting to happen is where the grassroots leaders are connecting with the institutions and the traditional top-down groups, uh, the economic developers, the cities, the universities, the governments. And the actual win-win and where you really start seeing more sustainable work is where those organizations figure out how to get together. Oftentimes they speak different languages, they have different metrics, they fight at first, um, but at the end of the day they want the same thing which is a better, cooler, more awesome Tampa Bay, for example. But the ecosystem builder's job, especially if they're coming from the grassroots, is to, is to figure out how to build that relationship with the institutions. And if you're an institutional leader, and maybe you work at a university or the government, your job is to go out in the community and find the leaders. They're typically entrepreneurs, but not always, who've started the co-working space or running a TEDx or, or maybe opened a co-working facility and figure out how that happens. I don't have a one-size-fits-all business model, but if you do, uh, write the book right now because everyone's looking for it. Hi, my name is Golam Monwar Kamal. I'm the managing director for a venture capital based in Bangladesh. And um, uh, all your points, I want to add, uh, get your opinion on, on, in terms of ethics. We always ask startup to think big, grow, make more money. Then we are also talking about sustainability for that company. But how about the sustainability of the whole ecosystem? If everybody wants to make money and everybody wants to grow fast, and the industry the, who are doing better, they are actually moving to share economy, disruption systems. Well, who will put the new ethics that you don't have to be so much profitable? Like, you know, the impact funding is increasing day by day. So which institution should give this principle or a direction? What do you think? Am I gonna take that one? You me? You, okay, I can take that one. So uh, what I'd say is the best ecosystems, and I mean natural ecosystems, like a rainforest or a coral reef, uh, they're regenerative, right? They're sustainable because the system gives back to the system. And I think that's true in the most thriving entrepreneurial ecosystems. So the one, you know, the one that's very famous that's mostly focused on consumer tech is Silicon Valley. But if you look at how Silicon Valley has progressed over its history, companies that started in the, in the 60s and the 50s, the silicon chip companies, their founders succeeded, made lots of money, but then invested in the folks that created the Hewlett Packards and the Apples. The folks who succeeded at the Apples and the Hewlett Packards invested in the things that created the Netscapes and the Facebooks. And the folks that created the Facebooks are investing in the Teslas or the, you know, whatever else the next generation will bring. But that, that is, is incredibly important. And what I would say is the role of the people who are building the ecosystem, which is all of us, is to model that behavior. Because it's ultimately a cultural value. Um, if you're familiar with the Techstars group and you're familiar with possibly Brad Feld, um, the investor uh, and also prolific writer, blogger, and so startup communities guy, he's sort of credited with this phrase, give first. It's not to say be altruistic and just give away everything but it's to act in any interaction, whether small, like a meeting, or an investment, as you are bringing something to the table to contribute, and to not try to take all the chips in the first move. It's that type of culture that creates a thriving ecosystem, just like that same regenerative culture works in a, like a rainforest or a coral reef. But it is up to us as leaders uh, uh, to, to model that, and as an investor, uh, to, to model that for your fellow investors in Bangladesh and elsewhere in the region. Uh, because that's that that otherwise it will the system will not last. I think you're you're absolutely spot on with your point. Hi, yeah, I have a question here. Uh, my name is Dash, and I'm I'm from Malaysia, and I run Startup Malaysia. I've been building or uh, trying to build uh, or building ecosystems for the last two decades now. Now, one of the observations I have on my through my experience, entrepreneurs in developing countries. Uh, where <clears throat> have two main roles. One is to create the adventures. The other is to create conditions that enable the creation. Does it make sense? And ecosystem builders basically help them 
with creating the conditions, which means they got to navigate a lot of difficult things like politics, like businesses and all that. And going back to the question of sustainability, how do they get themselves paid? Um, so entrepreneurs who are also ecosystem builders always build a business model like creating events, like what you said, to get themselves paid. But what happens in the process is that when you build events and then you profit from the events, but at the same time you're doing a lot for the entrepreneurs on the ground, the ecosystem builder usually loses trust of the community because the community always thinks that the ecosystem builder is benefiting from their plight. Mm. And this happens at very regularly and not just in one ecosystem. I've seen this in many, many, many ecosystems. Because in developing countries where countries have to do a lot of stuff to get the entrepreneurs up, trust levels are low. It's not like in the United States or in European countries. You know, trust levels are low. People lose trust uh, very uh, quickly. So how do you overcome the trust deficit that constantly happens to ecosystem builders, which makes ecosystem builders ineffective as you grow? So, uh, <laughs> so actually, um, this is why uh, inclusion is so important. And this is one of the reasons, this is one of the, uh, one of the reasons inclusion is so important, right? So, um, but you're essentially talking about entrenchment and the development of entrenchment as the ecosystem grows. And so one of the, the priorities with inclusion is to make sure that enough people are at the table to make sure that they're part of the growth of the system organically so that um, you can actually inspire trust over time, right? So, and, and there is a tipping point, right? At the, and, and so that's why um, inclusion is so important both in the United States and in developing countries, but that I think what you're talking about really is making sure that there is inclusion throughout the process and that it starts with inclusion and it's not something you add later. Yeah, I, I agree with your inclusion, but I think it's, it's going to be a constant battle for entrepreneurs because there are always the uh, people who are uh, on, the, in the t on the table are the the inner circle, and then the inner circle also loses trust. You know what I mean? <coughs> so there's a lot of work yeah. that needs to go in, and uh, it's it's a tough balance actually. So I just wanted to put it out there because I think it's something that all of us need to keep in mind and find a formula uh, um, on how to be effective, transparent, constantly communicate at the same time build trust. Yeah, I think you, I would just add that I think what you said is correct and what you're saying right at the end is really good. This is a complex question. The short, not sufficient answer is that I think the role of the ecosystem builder is really a servant leader and that it's very easy as an ecosystem builder to forget that and turn yourself into a little bit of a deity or a, or a mayor and say, oh, this is my ecosystem. And as soon as you start saying my ecosystem and my entrepreneurs, you gotta catch yourself because you realize you're putting yourself in a position above everyone else, and it's how do you become a servant leader where your job is to support everyone else, including the entrepreneurs, and maybe at some point to step back and actually pass that, that baton. But you've, you've, you've highlighted a very important, that's a huge common question, and I think the question of how do I get paid and sustainable funding is big, so good questions. We have time for one more. Hi, my name is Ahmed, and I'm from uh, Triple Nine Startups. It's a uh, startup hub in Sudan. Uh, for the previous year, we have been using the programs of Copan and, uh, uh, and the knowledge to, for the capital to, to build the ecosystem and to work very fine. So I've been the couple last months we have been trying to go also the capital, specifically to rural area and state, like post-conflict areas like Darfur, for example, in Sudan. And I um, was just uh, wondering if you have in your mind a similar uh, region or a similar country been classified as a post-conflict area where people actually build an ecosystem there because it's really difficult. We find lots of international players there. You find lots of organization and lots of uh, different ways of building ecosystems. Uh, in addition to the fact that underdeveloped economics and developed ecosystems in, in that place, do you have any similar experience you have in mind? You can we can you can see have a look at. Thank you. Uh, so. Um I think, so in the US, there's, it's difficult to find comparisons. 
Um, one thing that I think is worth just pointing out, I don't know how many um, people have direct experience with post-conflict, um, but uh, it, there's a myth that these economies are stagnant, right? And they're not. Um, and so I think when you're looking, um, there's been quite a bit of good work. There's actually someone, um, I think to your right, that works on uh, entrepreneurship among um, uh, refugees. Uh, so um, when you're talking about those ecosystems, you're not necessarily talking about um, nothing, building something from nothing. You're actually talking about a lot of the questions that this gentleman from Malaysia raised, which is how do you create a more equitable and inclusive ecosystem from something that actually needs to be transformed, right? Um, so uh, there's, um, I'd be happy to talk with you later about some resources. I think in the United States, the, the closest that we might see to the disorganization is a post-disaster context. So most recently, you'd be looking at um, uh, events in Texas and Puerto Rico, um, Katrina, those types of things. Um, but you know, it's, it's a difficult comparison to make because the baseline, um, just from a resources perspective, is very different. But I'd love to chat. The, the other the one piece I would just add is the work that I did previously at Coffin Foundation. I was a social entrepreneur focused on ecosystem building in the US state of Iowa. And the, we actually started the work because there was a giant flood that destroyed the central business district. And what that allowed for was a little bit of a reset button on the way things were. And I think there's a common phrase you hear a lot, don't waste a good disaster or a good crisis. And because we had had that flood, we could have different conversations about the future and the possibility of the place because everything was thrown off. Whereas if we'd done it without that disaster, everyone would say, well, we don't do entrepreneurship around here or we got that figured out, but everything had been destroyed downtown. So it was a chance to try to change the conversation that had been going on for decades. Um, but uh, talk with uh, Sammy here, possibly after your, uh, your research, you were, you were being very humble, but her actual uh, research has been in post-conflict situations in entrepreneurship. One quick one. Which comes first, the, uh, you know, the horse or the cart? Do we start to build the ecosystem and then attract the players and the actors, or do we introduce the actors to the ecosystem from the beginning? Uh, that, that, the, the entrepreneurs are always first. You totally screw things up if you start with the entrepreneurial support organization. Love you all. We're also an entrepreneurial support organization. The conversation will go crazy if you say, hey, let's get everyone together that supports entrepreneurial support organizations. It always has to start with the entrepreneurs. I think you, you're, I, I know we've chatted before. I know you know the, you're asking that question because you're giving me a low hanging fruit here, but you have to start with the entrepreneurs. And what I would highly emphasize is before you go hire a consultant to come in and determine what the needs are in your ecosystem, have coffee with 50 entrepreneurs. Uh, and this is always the recommendation I give to people that are new to ecosystem building is don't hire anybody. It's gonna cost you 50 cups of coffee. You can do one a week, it'll take you a year. And you just ask those entrepreneurs two questions. Question number one, what's your story? Question number two, how can I help? If you sit and listen for 50 coffees, you will have a ton of information about the state of your ecosystem. On individually, the entrepreneurs maybe don't know what the ecosystem means, but actually collectively, 50 of them will tell you what needs to be done. So if you keep hearing, there's no one to help me. If you keep hearing, I can't find a mentor. If you keep hearing, I don't know where to get money. It's those patterns that you hear that are indicative of what are the needs in your ecosystem. But you have to start with the entrepreneurs because if you go ask the entrepreneurial support organizations what they need, they're all just gonna say they need more money to do their programs, which maybe isn't entirely incorrect but you're focusing on the wrong thing. I think if you start with the entrepreneurs, you get a lot of excitement about the possibility of entrepreneurship in this place. Everyone else will follow. And if you get lost, go have coffee with entrepreneurs and they will re-ground re you in where you need to be. All right, well, do you want to close this out, Sammy? Yeah, I think uh, we're probably out of time and it looks like out of questions. So um, thank you very much for joining us. We love coming here and we learn so much and we'd love to chat the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much.